we have the unenviable position of uh, following the vice president and being the last discussion before lunch. Uh, but I promise you it's, uh, it's a really interesting one and um, something that I've had an opportunity to work with our panelists very closely on. Uh, I found myself saying over and over, like, oh, this administration has passed once in a generation investment in, in the form of the American Rescue Plan. Oh, wait, our second once in a generation investment through CHIPS, I mean three with bipartisan infrastructure. Wait, you see where I'm going. Okay, four with the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we have these incredible opportunities that we know can translate into real wealth building opportunities for communities of color, for businesses owned by people of color. But these public investments are not enough, particularly when it comes to equity investments. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And in particular, I want to bring to light a uh, set of investments from Treasury through states, the State Small Business Credit Initiative, because this is a really unique opportunity with public funds to connect uh, communities of color and other underserved communities with that high growth equity capital. But how do we do it? We know that the pipelines uh, are not there. We know that this market is not serving communities of color very well. You all know the statistics. I'm sure the folks watching online know the statistics that black founders are getting 1.2% uh, of venture funding, that uh, Latinx companies are getting 2.1, and women founders 2%. And of that 2%, only 1.8% of that went to women of color. And keep in mind, venture capital is just a small slice of the equity capital that's available. Yet we know that these early infusions, particularly for low wealth communities, as we just heard from the vice president, that are already starting from behind, it's challenging for them to jumpstart their businesses and move to scale without this kind of investment. So here to solve it all today is this amazing panel <laughs> that I'm really happy to work with. Um, I want to start with uh, David Clooney, CEO of the Black Economic Alliance, and see if you can just help set the context here for us. What do you see as the biggest barriers facing entrepreneurs of color when they're in search of capital, and in particular, that high growth capital that's going to help them scale? How long do we have? <laughs> Uh, so thank you for having me, and thank you for this administration's unprecedented focus on racial equity with a, with a laser focus on the net benefit uh, to our entire economy of getting this right and closing these gaps. So um, I, to put it mildly and, and to, you know, I, I think we have the right backdrop quite literally and figuratively of uh, the Freedmen's Bank and thinking about the objective of the Freedmen's Bank, but the legacy of systemic racism and the impact that that has had on the reality of our financial system. Um, you know, previously you had primarily white men making decisions about where capital was going. That hasn't changed all that much. <laughs> um, but then even after, uh, in the, the mid-70s, um, you know, the, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, you know, instituting credit scores is supposed to do away. You can't make, you know, decisions based on race. All of these traditional factors that impact, you know, credit and, and worthiness of a company uh, and, and its ability to grow are still impacted by his, uh, the, the systemic uh, or the legacy of racism uh, that has left black and Latinx communities with, you know, less wealth, uh, without home ownership, without collateral. Um, so, you know, those are the, the, that's the easy answer and traditional answer, but I think we also learned some of the mechanical challenges uh, from the Paycheck Protection Program mm -hmm. around, you know, not having traditional relationships with banks, not having the capacity of, you know, many employees or um, accountants and lawyers to uh, fill out really complicated paperwork. So there are um, kind of macro and micro reasons, but, but it is very clear that the system is broken. Um, and, and if we are going to unlock the potential of communities of color, we really have to be very intentional about going to um, really the mechanical as well as the um, institutional reasons that communities of color have not um, been invested in uh, and, and are still not uh, today.
right? Um, so let me come to uh, Carlos and to Scott. We, we often hear this uh, challenge. We have a set of entrepreneurs that are raising their hand. They're ready for capital. Uh, they have a hard time connecting with that capital. Um, we maybe don't always hear as much from the challenge that investors have, not just of finding the pipeline, but you face a different set of barriers when trying to match the, the capital and the products that you have to the needs of the entrepreneur. Um, from the perspective of the chief investment officer and the head of the California Investment and Economic Bank, um, uh, tell us a little bit about, or I'm sorry, infrastructure, <laughs> An economic bank. Sorry about that. Um, tell us a little bit from your perspective um, the the challenges that you see investors face, and then we'll get in a little bit into solutions. Well, thank you for having me here today. So let's let's start by taking stock on where we are today, mm -hmm. right? So as you mentioned, of venture backed startups, one percent mm -hmm. are black founders, mm -hmm. and two percent are Latino founders. And part of the reason for that is if you look at the decision makers in the venture capital firms themselves, only 3% of investment partners mm -hmm. in the venture industry are black. 2% okay. are Latino. Mm -hmm. And uh, a study came out two weeks ago written by my former professor, Josh Lerner, as a co-author, uh, called Racial Diversity in Private Capital. Mm -hmm. And it took a deep dive into the asset management industry and found that 1.4% of assets in America mm. are controlled by diverse owned firms mm -hmm. and decision makers. And so that's part of the problem, right? And so they also found that the diverse owned firms and funds have a much harder time raising initial capital and that investors in their funds have much less tolerance for anything less than strong performance. And so there's a lot behind that. And, and so why are we here where we are? And part of that is you look at the historical vestiges, and, and there, there are a lot of systemic and deliberate racist policies in the finance industry. But today, it's very different. It's much more subtle and subconscious with implicit biases, right? And really fixing the prior start lines. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that that we think about is that um, we need to change behaviors. It's, it's no longer about just the systems, the laws. We need to change behaviors because it's these inherent behaviors that are causing this. And when you talk to investors in the venture industry, they often talk about trust in their decision making based on their network of relationships. These networks of relationships are quite closed. They're confined to a handful of elite universities country clubs, social clubs, dining clubs, boarding schools, and they're, they're insular. As, at the same time, you always hear venture capitalists talk about making their decisions based on you know, pattern recognition. Yeah. And those patterns are established by what yeah. might have worked in the past with people that they look to emulate in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's tough to follow the vice president and also when uh, Previous two remarks can borrowed on some of the remarks I had prepared in terms of the statistics. Janice, thank you very much to you and Secretary Yellen for the invitation today. It's an honor for me to join you in this panel and to be with all of you, remembering the aspirations of the Freedman Bank and living, seeing how we can live up to that aspiration today. So if we look at our history and very fitting with the event today, there's a, we have a history of systemic biases that have created inequities that we're trying to solve for today. And I do believe that during the span of our careers, we have an opportunity to make meaningful change to those inequities that have been ingrained into our system. Uh, as you mentioned, Scott, on, the, on that ninth foundation, only 1% of all broadly man, uh, defined investment, investable assets are managed by diverse owned firms. So the, the diversity of the decision makers and the decision makers in venture capital with 3%, as you said, that leads to certain level of decisions. We talked about the low level of funding to venture capital funders. One thing to remember as well is that for every dollar of savings, uh, median savings for a white household, uh, there's only about 10 cents of saving for a black or Hispanic household, which means that early friends and family investment round for a real estate project or a company doesn't happen. So how do we start providing some supplementary capital at that early ideation stage for early businesses is one of the challenges we're trying to solve for. Um, another thing is if you look at vendor spend, only if you, Fortune 500 companies are only 
5% of their spend goes to diverse vendors. And if you translate that to human interaction, an example that I have for you, we're meeting in 2019 with a, one of the top tier venture capital firms. And the example they gave us is they said, we look at our investment funnel, right? So at the top of the funnel is how many ideas are coming in and then the decision making process. And they're coming to us, and this was uh, based on, on gender because they had no experience around investments with uh, founders that were diverse by race and ethnicity. And they said, well, we've invested in two female founded companies, but we've looked at our decision making and it's not biased. The problem are women. They're just not creating companies. And that was 2019. That conversation has changed from where we were in 2019, thankfully. And I see that level of progression also externally. And part of what we're doing is we've done $31 million in grants to support the ecosystem for nonprofits and small businesses, and as well as investing with diverse managers that have the local expertise to start providing the capital that we can now also act as a bridge. There's that last mile delivery challenge, right? How can we all be bridge makers between the decision makers that are still perhaps functioning under an old system to the new entrepreneurs that are diverse by nature and are looking for that funding? So I, one of the reasons why I'm so excited by, about the State Small Business Credit Initiative is uh, it's one of our few programs that really allows us to invest equity capital uh, into the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, and there's, there's this huge opportunity, I think, in doing so to really reshape the way that capital is flowing to entrepreneurs of color. Like, how can we seize this moment where we have public funds going out for equity to kind of remake the way that equity flows to entrepreneurs of color and to other um, uh, disadvantaged communities. So Scott, I'd like to come back to you. Tell, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now and how working with SSBCI dollars are going to allow you to, um, to change your approach or add something oh, new. SSBCI is a fantastic opportunity for the state of California to usher in new approaches to decision making, to allocation of capital. It enables, I mean, we can't sit around and wait for the markets to self-correct in an appropriate time frame. That, that's become quite obvious. And so we have to be explicit and deliberative. We have to use our funds to break open those closed networks to broader representation of Californians. We need to use our funds to really think about creating new patterns for success. I mean, the venture capital industry, right, that, that's the tip of the scale for innovation in the financial world and they're largely headquartered in the Bay Area, one of the most progressive areas in the nation, and, and they haven't been able to figure this out. So we have to help. We have to step in. We've been able to use our SSBCI funds to launch a state venture capital program entirely focused on including more underrepresented uh, venture investors to support more underrepresented founders and small business owners and to serve more of the underserved regions of California. And so, but we also have to start by looking inward, right? Because at iBank, a majority of our staff is female or minority. A majority of our executive team is female or minority. We work in our loan guarantee program throughout the state with seven nonprofit financial develop development corporations. Their staff is comprised of 73% mm. minorities. Mm -hmm. And SSBCI has a very strong requirement for something called SETI, right? Socially and economically disadvantaged uh, individually owned businesses. And so for the state of California, you've set a target of 49% of our funds have to be uh, uh, used to support SETI owned businesses. That's an incredibly ambitious target. But I'll tell you right now that if at the end of the day, we don't exceed 75%, I will be extremely disappointed. I'm, I'm happy to hear about this target. That is really exciting. And we know other states are, um, are similarly stretching beyond what they've done before, um, but they need some help. They're creating products. They're connecting with pipelines of, of diverse entrepreneurs. And Carlos, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, the announcement that was made this morning, partnership between you and the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation or the Kellogg Foundation and uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation to create the Fund for Inclusive Entrepreneurship. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it's going to work with SSBCI and, and programs like what we're hearing in California? Absolutely. So we're thrilled to be part of this initiative. We do think it's a historic, once-in-a-generation opportunity to drive change and impact to the communities that we serve. 
We think that the fund will have the opportunity to leverage over $10 billion of federal funding into community. And we have decades of work trying to integrate disadvantaged communities into the economic system so the U.S. economy works for all. Um, and in this moment, we believe that right, as an investment team, we've traveled. I used to travel 200,000 miles a year, eight times around the globe looking for opportunities with several people on my team doing the same. This is the moment to unleash that type of potential inside our own domestic markets. We have that opportunity at the moment and think that private resources will absolutely follow federal dollars here because the opportunity is enormous. So, David, I want to come back to you because hopefully what we're doing here is setting the, setting the table with uh, really excellent opportunities to, to redesign the flow of capital, prime it up for entrepreneurs of color, but we need to make sure that we've got the, the pipelines and the entrepreneurs both uh, are ready and know how to connect to that capital. Can you talk to us a little bit about what BEA is doing in this regard? Absolutely. So let me first um, break a bit of a myth, which is that there just is no pipeline. And, and we hear this so frequently that there just aren't enough investable Right. You know, ready to scale businesses from communities of color that we can invest in. We have all this capital ready. If only they were there. Um, and and the as we heard from from Carlos, we just can't find enough women. Right. We know exactly. that we know that this is not the case. We we, we hear the same. Uh, and and the the sprinkling of fact there, most of that is fiction, is that. Um, it is true that you know, businesses of color, particularly black businesses, for example, over 95% of black businesses are sole proprietorships, um, and they have trouble scaling because of a lack of access to capital and because of a lack of access to friends and family money, because of you know, a lack of generational wealth, um, and be because we are, as the vice president talked about, uh, denied for loans at a significantly uh, disproportionately higher rate. But with all that aside, there are absolutely um, businesses that are ready to in, uh, invest in and, and scale. And, you know, this is something we heard at the Black Economic Alliance during the pandemic, days after George Floyd, not, um, you know, uh, not coincidentally, where folks would reach out to us from the alternative investment community and say, we want to invest in more black entrepreneurs. We just can't find them. Please help us. And we can't create them out of thin air. We say... They're there. You need better proximity. You need to get out of the Bay Area and get off of the West Coast. But um, also, you know, you absolutely can create them out of thin air. You cre create companies out of thin air all the time. You invest in them. You incubate them. You give them the resources they need to grow. So, you know, some examples of programs that we have stood up that, that are, you know, examples of things that particularly the private sector can be doing are the Center for Black Entrepreneurship that uh, Black Economic Alliance started in partnership with um, Spelman and Morehouse Colleges. And we've recently brought in Clark Atlanta University to go to, you know, a target-rich environment of HBCUs, particularly in Atlanta, uh, the second largest collection of black folks in America, one of the, you know, hubs of black business uh, in America, and invest, create, you know, an ecosystem of exposure, opportunity, and ultimately investment uh, in black entrepreneurs in a way that is meant to create a multiplier effect um, of investment in other black communities and, and, and black, invest, um, uh, black businesses. And then uh, the BEA Entrepreneurs Fund, as well as a $50 million venture capital fund we've stood up um, to not only provide provide the, the seed and startup capital that uh, businesses need, but particularly the support they need to grow. And that's both capital, but also the post-investment support, uh, mentorship, and, and, and entrepreneurship uh, kind of examples that they need. And, and I'd give an example of, you know, one of our uh, board members, Rich Lou Dennis, the founder of Shea Moisture, in the deal uh, that he uh, brokered with Unilever to acquire Shea Moisture, part of it was a, uh, creating the New Voices Fund, a $100 million fund to invest in black, particularly black women entrepreneurs. And through that fund, just in the last two years, they've created over 30 black millionaires. And you think about you know, the multiplier effect of those uh, entrepreneurs then investing in other black businesses, then mentoring other black businesses and reinvesting in their community. That is what we're trying to unlock. And there's absolutely so much potential there if we you know, help uh, companies get out of their own way and, and uh, investors get out of their own way and invest in black and brown companies. And so can you, I'm going to have you um, pick at this a little bit more. Uh, and uh, not only do we have um, two really important colleagues on stage, but we have a room full of folks that are investors or um, uh, have the resources to help us think about the um, driving investment capital to black and brown owned businesses. What do you need from 
investors. And one of the things that I'm thinking about that I'd love to hear you comment on is the experience with these funds. One of the things that I often hear about is like we, we tend to default to venture. Venture is a very specific kind of equity um, when really what our community needs are different kinds of equity. Um, can be market rate. It's sort of like the assumption that if you're not venture, then you're talking about concessionary. We're not talking about concessionary. Um, but there's a wide range of of ways to invest in businesses that are really going to set them up for success. Can you just say a little bit more about that experience and maybe what you need from investors? Absolutely. So let me be very clear. The, the first and foremost thing we need is capital. <laughs> and our fund was launched with an anchor investment of $20 million from Wells Fargo that was transformational uh, and really sparked other investment from others. So that is the starting place. But you also need, I talked about post-investment support. That is creating um, that is creating an ecosystem of support and exposure, but also um, technical assistance to investors so that they're getting the resources they need, they, that they're not reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the, you know, what is needed for, uh, and particularly first time um, entrepreneurs and founders is examples of how people have done this before, is access to, you know, John Rogers talked about this at, at our breakfast this morning, which was, um, you know, even better than capital is access to customers mm -hmm. and access to a sustainable flow of income that will, you know, help a business scale, grow, and be sustainable over time. So it is, it is that entire um, uh, uh, ecosystem of, of support and opportunity and capital, not only the initial investment, but also the kind of post-investment um, technical assistance, uh, introducing folks to your network, and then creating sustainable opportunities for business growth. Mm -hmm. So, Scott and Carlos, I want to um, come back to you in the in the few moments that we have left, and reflecting on some of what you've heard from David, the um, the kind of innovation that you expect to see uh, amongst investors um, based on the work that that you're doing, and maybe answers some of what uh, David is calling for uh, in the market. Well, there there needs to be innovation all around. We need to better apply technology to originate and reach. Uh, the customer to provide, you know, language support and technical assistance. We need to better uh, use securization to draw more capital into the marketplace for these products. And we need to leverage p potentially artificial intelligence to help reduce the biases in underwriting and investment decisions. And so but we need to do this all together. It's not just the industry. The, the financial markets are actually quite dynamic and ever-evolving. They react very quickly to everyday information and, and, and new insights. And, and so we need to evolve with them. You know, we can't, as a public entity, just think we could take a couple of years to draft up very rigid rules and then sit on them for the next 10 years and for it to be applicable to the marketplace. We need to be adaptable. We need to evolve with what's happening on the ground. And fortunately, SSBCI enables that for us. And so let me give you a quick example. I, I, you know, in March of 2020, when COVID lockdowns started, mm -hmm. you know, uh, furiously, we sat down and within days, on April 2nd, we launched a COVID microloan guarantee program targeting the smallest of small businesses, those that have an average of under five employees uh, for loans under uh, $50,000 on average. And we've served several thousand of those entities in the height of that pandemic uh, because we were able to draw in private sector investors who were willing to go outside their comfort zone. We had to go outside our comfort zone, do something new and innovative. They had to as well, and they met us and provided those thousands of loans. And, and we reached 86% female-owned, minority-owned, and businesses in low to moderate income tracks. And so that led to, a couple months later, we realized, well, those CDFIs didn't have enough access to capital. And so I worked closely with my California colleagues at the time who are now Secretary Yellen, uh, <laughs> Deputy Secre Assistant Secretary Morris, uh, uh, Administrator Guzman, mm -hmm. and also uh, Laura Tyson. We all sat down and strategized about how we could coalesce a public-private partnership mm -hmm. to bring all the entities we needed involved to address and tackle the scale of that problem. And that became something called the California Rebuilding Fund. Mm -hmm. And so it brought in corporations and banks. It brought in philanthropists and public sector entities and municipalities to draw in more capital. And so those are the type of innovations that you have to be prepared to move on and act quickly. Yeah. 
So I see an opportunity here on capacity building. Treasury issue announced that they're committing $300 million to do capacity building to make the most of SSBCI. And, and also that opportunity to provide equity capital, I think, is, is huge. That will, that's the scarcest of capital. It should have in, enormous returns, both socially and economically. Three quick examples of where we see innovation. And, and uh, the general themes will be around partnerships between public, nonprofit, and corporate. Uh, so that gives you a lot more dollars around a single idea and then different structures of capital, like Scott said, around securitization. So uh, J.P. Morgan started a new share class on their money market called Empower. So you, you, you're facing J.P. Morgan Chase. They have the capacity to sort very large amounts of capital. So we're sitting usually in $150 million of cash. Now, if we were to give that to J.P. Morgan, that actually gets dispersed to select MDIs that we pre-select through the program. It doesn't create the regulatory burden of deposits, but it does provide operating budget to MDIs. We think that's very helpful to those organizations. The second one, and we're very focused on the transmission mechanism. I mean, there's a deluge of dollars coming in. The transmission mechanisms that we have in our system today, the, the plumbing, if I may be so crass, wasn't designed for this amount of money. So there'll be some pain points in there that I think private sector could be really helpful, and non nonprofits as well. Second project, there's a group called uh, Navajo Power. It's a, they do utility-scale solar uh, projects, so we ended up working in New Mexico in a project with them. It involved grant capital, program-related investments, as well as commercial investments through a securitization. That funded a solar project that, that had a commercial partner with a local utility, so you have nonprofit dollars, and then you have tribal communities working together to have a very large-scale project with a commercial player providing cash as well as providing expertise. And part of those proceeds will go back to help uh, local tribal communities. And finally, we're investors in a fund called SOAR, which is the Southern Opportunity and Resilience Fund, and that's doing a lot of work backing CDFIs to amplify their ability to lend. Right? So they have the capacity and the proximity. We're just helping amplify that capital through a structure that's regulatory-friendly for CDFIs. Um, so you mentioned the technical assistance, and I want to quickly give our colleagues at the Department of Commerce a shout-out uh, because they are uh, leading a 100 million of the commitment to uh, technical assistance, and they're going to be great, great partners, I think, on this uh, equity piece in particular. Um, so we're at time. I'm going to ask us to wrap with 15 seconds each. One thing that you can ask this crowd for, how, how can they help you or what can they be doing in, in their work uh, to advance uh, uh, supporting entrepreneurs of color, other diverse entrepreneurs getting access to high growth equity capital? I'll go first and say get outside of your comfort zone. Talk to people you haven't worked with before. Work with organizations you haven't worked with before. This is a target-rich environment, as I like to say, in this room. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as we talked about behavior change. We need to be going to different places to drive better uh, results. I would just say come join us. I mean, there's the room on this boat for all of us because we need to work together. SSBCI is very well designed in that it requires a high level of private sector leverage. You know, I'll just point very quickly to SSBCI, uh, SSBCI 1.0, we applied $84 million to our loan guarantee program. Since 2013, it's now supported $1.8 billion of loans. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we led the nation in the, the number of jobs created under SSBCI 1.0. We were able to apply 62% of the financings to diverse owned businesses. And this time around with 2.0, with $1.2 billion, we have plans to put out $18 billion of private capital, and we need your partnership in order to do that, your technical assistance, your marketing, and just your resolve. Thank you. I'll quote the poet Pitbull. And, <laughs> <laughs> and in his often repetitive songs, he says, let's take this moment and turn it into a movement. We have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really bend the arc of history. So it's the era of impact innovation. Give us a call. We want to partner. There's a lot of topics where we can make the difference together. Well, that's a really excellent call to action. And the, the next thing that this crowd is going to do together is divide up into a series, of small group, a series of small group conversations where we can take many of the things that we've heard about on this stage uh, and break them down and figure out how do we translate them into action steps. And really, how do we commit to each other and to uh, partners not in the room? How are we going to move all of this work forward? So I want to thank uh, my esteemed panelists. I want to thank all of you that, are, uh, that have joined us uh, in the room, stayed flexible with us throughout this schedule. Um, more to come. Thank you so much.